For many people living under coronavirus restrictions, a life of enforced isolation has become the new normal. Cut off from friends, family and work colleagues, how do we prevent an epidemic of loneliness? This is Roundtable. Millions of people in countries across the world are getting used to their own company, following instructions to stay indoors to protect themselves and the rest of the public from coronavirus. But what about the impact on our mental health? Millions of people around the world have been asked to disconnect and to self-isolate as the COVID-19 pandemic continues. Some countries like France have imposed strict lockdowns, only allowing people to make trips to supermarkets, pharmacies and workplaces if necessary. And even when people are allowed near others, they're asked to stay a safe distance away of at least two meters. All these efforts are to prevent the spread of the virus and to reduce pressure on hospitals. But the regime of social distancing and self-isolation brings its own challenges. Experts say it can have negative consequences on people's mental health, especially among the elderly, the poor and minorities. It could also increase the risk of stress, loneliness and depression, and people who live alone could find it more difficult than others. So, in preventing the spread of COVID-19, how do we prevent an epidemic of loneliness? Joining us at the roundtable from London is Robert West, who's a professor of health psychology at University College London. We have Elizabeth Archer, who is head of services at Toynbee Hall. And we have Dimitrios Chivrikos, who is a behavioural scientist at University College London. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. So one of the major ways to fight the spread of coronavirus is known here as social distancing. But of course, being separated from friends and family is having other impacts too. For many, it means social isolation, of course. What do people who are socially isolated feel? What happens to them? What are the potential consequences? Well, we know that there are health implications to being lonely. We, uh, there's a huge body of research out there around it with older people. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it has a huge impact on people and, and people's routines have been completely disrupted as well. Uh, so, yeah, we're hearing in our services from a lot of older people who are saying this is, it's not just being in your home. It's not just not having the freedoms that you used to have. It's not having that incidental conversation that you'd have down the co-op when you're picking up your pint of milk that's actually making a huge difference to people's days. And I think particularly for people who aren't used to the kind of technology we're using today, uh, this is a really challenging time. I mean, it, it's, it's uh, as well as being uh, physical differences, there are also mental health differences, aren't there? There are health effects. It varies hugely from person to person. And I think the thing that we have to recognize with all of this is the huge diversity of experiences that people will have. There'll be many people who up till now are not too bad, are okay, because as you mentioned earlier, they have the technology to stay in touch with friends and family. Uh, they, they're not necessarily desperately worried about their livelihoods and their businesses that uh, uh, other people are, are finding are you know, a, a real problem. Um, so for them, uh, they may have gardens, uh, you know, there's all sorts of ways in which they can mitigate this problem. And then at the other extreme, you've got people who are already, even before this, living in very difficult circumstances. They're potentially socially isolated already. Loneliness is a huge problem, particularly for the elderly in this country and in many countries around the world. And, and then you put this on top of it. And of course, it's a massive issue. And then on top of that, you have the fact that you, uh, people differ in their need for uh, social uh, company, as it were. Um, you know, there are people who, some people are more anxious than others. Uh, constitutionally, it's quite a big uh, factor. And others have greater need for, uh, you know, uh, the kind of interactions that many of us take for granted. 
So, you know, across this, we've got a vast diversity. And, and I think that the really important thing is to identify those people who are most vulnerable and who are most in need of support. And we can find support for them. You know, there's huge uh, willingness out there in the communities, in local communities. And I'm seeing this in my own community in North London for people to support each other in every way possible. And some people have reported having what uh, might be called cabin fever, which is uh, a change to your mental state being stuck inside for a period of time. Is this a real phenomenon? Well, if I can say, I mean, I, I feel that I've experienced cabin fever every now and then myself in a very mild way. It's nice to get out. Um, but, you know, to be honest, I think, you know, compared with the kind of experience that uh, many people are suffering from, it's a, it's a relatively modest uh, issue. Um, and, you know, people can get out. And, and you know, we're hearing uh, already that in countries like the UK that, uh, you know, the government is considering taking further steps to restrict people's movements and so on. Personally, I think in our country that would be a big mistake. Uh, I don't think that the evidence supports at the moment the, the need for that kind of thing, um, but it would further exacerbate the problems that I was talking about earlier for people who live in overcrowded accommodation, they don't have access to outside spaces, and certainly having access to an outside space is an important feature of anyone's life, really. And Dimitrios is, oh, oh, oh sorry, um, Elizabeth, carry on. I was just going to say that the government uh, guidance that was the letter that's been sent out to vulnerable people is really interesting in um, the assumptions it makes about what resources people have. So it says, you know, sit yourself by a nice view if you have one, use your garden if you have one. And actually in the area that Toynbee Hall's based in, um, we're in the middle of Tower Hamlets and hardly anyone has a garden. Um, hardly anyone has a balcony. If you've got a nice view, then you're incredibly lucky. And um, and it is a different experience being isolated in uh, a tower block where you have to share a lift with other people every time you go out um, to being isolated in a large family home with a garden. And um, and so that that feeling of being of being trapped can be uh, a real thing, um, particularly if, um, as Robert said earlier, you're in overcrowded housing, which is a massive, massive issue in Tower Hamlets. And so, Demetrius, are we talking about actual uh, medical stress that can be caused from social, is social isolation? I think sort of you know, self-isolation or social isolation is something that is quite new for all of us. I mean, of course, we have, you know, there's you know, a lot of studies and a lot of papers that have documented the, the very effect of loneliness of people and the effect of stress and anxiety that can, that can create. But I think what is also on top of this, what we is quite worrying here, is that level of uncertainty. I think people can be dealing with an you know, stressful situation if they know how to, to work around it. I think so far the guidelines, the help that we've actually been receiving, it's a good starting point, but by far they don't provide any solutions as to how we can cope with such measures due to us, as the other panelists sort of mentioned, the individual differences in terms of where we live, with who are we living, and so on. I think that level of uncertainty for me is just the one that we all have to be worried about just because I think at times people that deal with that level of uncertainty tend to be slightly more stressed and tend to be more anxious and anxiety and stress cannot lead to anything good at this stage. And you mentioned the government guidance of perhaps getting out in your garden if you have one looking at a nice view. Is there anything else practical that people can do to help mitigate self-isolation and negative feelings arising from it? Uh, we set up some, some volunteering opportunities. We've got people making phone calls to their neighbours, so they're having kind of real social conversations. Um, and that, that it's phone calls and not internet-based is quite important for some of our older people because it just feels a bit more natural. Uh, but we also set up a virtual community centre. So we had to close our community centre, like most community centres across uh, across England at the moment, um, 
And we have about 150 people who regularly come in and do things like yoga or play bingo or just have chats together. And we've tried to recreate that space online and activities against isolation Facebook page. And the idea is that you can go there and you can take part in a yoga class. But you can also just have a chat about something silly with someone who you'd normally sit next door to. And that's got a timetable against it, which I think is also really important because our days are long and putting a timetable against them so that you know what you can expect to happen when I think is a really nice way of keeping yourself safe and sane. Mm. Yes, if I can add to that, I think that uh, the timetable uh, point is a very, very good one for pretty well everyone. I think that uh, we need to be able to structure our days, uh, that uh, you need to know when you get up, uh, you know, what you're going to do when. And I think uh, this is an area where uh, the government and or the uh, authorities or Public Health England could probably give some better advice or, or clearer advice, more specific advice on how to achieve that for different people uh, so that the day doesn't look like a sort of empty uh, space sort of uh, stretching out before you. And it's not just the days. And I think the, the other the point uh, also that was made, I think, is was a good one around around uncertainty and um, we don't know how long this is going to last. We're just at the beginning of this. Uh, the, the likelihood is that this will be two or three months, probably, if not longer, depending on how things go. And we have to pace ourselves. People do adapt. You, you know, we, we hear of individual cases, you know, Terry Wade, uh, who was held hostage, and, and other cases. And of course, you've got people in nuclear submarines who are uh, underwater for months on end. So, you know, people can adapt. But there's lots that we can do in terms of advice and support to help people to do that and structuring your day, pacing yourself. And and I think, as I said earlier, one of the things really that we absolutely the governments absolutely need to do and is to help reduce the uncertainty um, around their livelihoods, around their I mean, they're, they're, they're facing near enough an existential threat, uh, you know, with their jobs and, and incomes and being able to feed themselves, at least that side of it should be relieved by um, you know, government action, in my opinion. So how important is it to keep to a routine? How does that help your mental state? Um, that's a really good question. I think keeping a routine is fundamental to a positive mindset and, you know, and sort of also keeping well with your level of well-being. I think you know, there are great guidelines in terms of if it's possible to get some physical exercise, if it's possible to sort of, you know, look after and stay connected with, with your loved ones. Uh, but one of the two important things that we keep seeing lately is that that fear of uncertainty and that fear of the panic has been fueled by the overconsumption of news and media and, and in different sort of you know, sources that perhaps they're not as valid as others. And that gets people even more worried in terms of you know, the intensity of the pandemic, as well as having news that perhaps are not as beneficial. So I think it's quite important to create almost a social media diet similar to any other diet that we might be following, that we're trying to limit the consumption of endless social media stories that, if anything, they're actually making matters worse. And a lot of people are turning to technology, aren't they, in order to connect with friends and family who they aren't able to see face to face. But is this a good substitute for a real relationship? Depends on your relationship, probably. <laughs> so I think that uh, I mean for many people it's it's a it's an absolute godsend. Uh, it, it is hugely important, and uh, and I think what we're seeing is that uh, large numbers of people are developing their as people do their skills and uh, experience with social media so that they can make use of it. Um, but it is also really important to. Uh, be aware that the, the sort of general social media, you know, the Twitter and the Facebook and the sort of uh, the largely unregulated social media can also be damaging. And for people who are already experiencing anxiety, uh, then when they start to hear stories that, that you know, uh, are frightening and, and probably invalid in many cases, then uh, that makes things worse. But I think keeping in touch with friends, family and so on uh, through social media is, is terrific. I think also there's a, a point to be made about this dependence on um, technology entrenching the inequality that already exists uh, in England. So uh, 
it's quite easy for me with my laptop to to get on and chat to my friends because it's just me using it but um in families where there's one piece of technology and several children and people are trying to do their schoolwork online and people are trying to stay in contact that's particularly difficult and i think um a lot of us assume that the cost of broadband is achievable for people but actually it isn't and particularly for a lot of elderly people who've never really kind of gotten into social media they've not really gotten into they don't see the point um, to suddenly find that everything they used to access is now taking part place online and that's an additional cost in a time when they're worried about so many other things um, there's some questions to be asked about how we make sure that this tool that we use is available for everybody and at the moment it really isn't there's a lot of inequality there in terms of access to technology and to and to data well, absolutely. Is this social isolation period just generally harder for people who are living tough lives? Lack of access to technology just being one of the issues that they might potentially face. I think yes. It's exacerbated <laughs> now. Yeah. I mean, uh, as 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 uh, you say, it's uh, um, you know those who have shall have more, and those who have not shall have what they have taken away, and to some degree, that's what's happened. And and I think this is where. Um, the local communities play such an important role and mobilising local communities and looking after your neighbours, whether you're in a tower block or you're in a, in a street of terraced houses or whatever your um, uh, uh, situation, if there's any way at all that you can volunteer for one of these local communities, and every community will have them. I know um, every community I'm aware of has uh, an opportunity to volunteer. Uh, then that would be a terrific thing to do. It could make such a difference to people's lives. Yeah, and in terms of kind of tackling isolation, a lot of the volunteers that we already have working for our organisation do it in order to make social connections. They were doing that before social isolation was a term we ever used. Um, people who were moving into London, um, students, uh, new migrants, uh, people who've moved for their jobs, people for whatever reason, were coming to us and saying, I don't know anybody yet. So if I come here and do something good for the community, it's going to give me an opportunity to, to feel good about myself, put some structure in my day, but also meet people. Um, and that's more important now than ever, really. Absolutely. I, I think the reality in Florida is that self-isolation, of course, medically speaking, we need to protect ourselves from the virus, but not every single home is safe. We've had an incredible raise in, you know, with, you know, people reporting domestic abuse in the UK, but 25% since this pandemic was actually started. Uh, there are teenagers that are still, you know, coming to terms with their own life choices, where it might happen or being accepted by their own families and so on. So human relationships are complex. The domestic environment that one may actually live is equally complex. So I think every single one of us, indeed, they can volunteer for any community projects has also started thinking very carefully to connect with people that we feel they might need a phone call, they might need someone to actually meaningfully connect with them. I think over the sudden we're all becoming super connected. We all try to communicate more, we're trying to catch up with friends that we haven't spoken and so on. I think this is the time for us to prioritize and actually focus upon the individuals that perhaps need that phone call or an email or a Skype call or whatever is available to them, to individuals or groups of individuals people who perhaps need that personal contact to talk to someone to actually make their own suppose, accommodation or their own settings slightly more safe because safety is not something that we should be taking for granted. Well absolutely this raises the point of uh, people, will, people will be experiencing self-isolation differently. There will be people who are isolating alone as the name implies but there will be people who are isolating together and that throws up a whole different range of challenges doesn't it? It does. I mean, just practical issues around, um, you know, infection control as well, which are hugely uh, problematic in, in certain households, obviously, depending on the spatial arrangements and who's living there. And um, I, I think another thing that we could probably do with more of would be some practical advice around all the different kind of living arrangements that people have and how they can uh, protect vulnerable people or if they know that they've got the uh, coronavirus that they can uh, keep themselves uh, isolated and there are ways of doing it I mean not 100% in many cases but certainly 
um, uh, ways of minimizing exposure. Um, but, but then obviously when it comes to being in a household where there is isolation going on, uh, you have to come to uh, you know, particular arrangements when it comes to getting shopping and, and so, so on. Um, and I think also very, very importantly, uh, and I'll, this is not so much to do with uh, the psychological effects of isolation, but actually about infection control. And that is, if you're in any kind of environment in which there is a risk of touching contaminated surfaces, which is quite likely in many cases, then probably the single most important thing you can do after washing your hands, which is really important all the time, um, is not to touch your face. And the reason is, that uh, that is how the virus gets into the body. There's only that's the only way really that it can get into the body. If someone, uh, if you either breathe it in through someone uh, exhaling it or sneezing or coughing, which is which can happen, but um, very importantly through through touching it, uh, a contaminated surface, and then touching your eyes, nose, or mouth. Now, touching your eyes, nose, or mouth, uh, what they, they call the T-zone, probably because it looks a bit like a T, um, is, is that final pathway to infection. Now, if you're in a high-risk situation, uh, it's really hard not to touch those parts of your face, but we have to do it. Um, and one of the things that people are starting to look at now is how to help people and train people and find a sort of physical ways of, uh, of achieving this uh, to, to keep that... Um, keep the virus away from these mucous membranes, which is how it gets into the body. I wonder if also there we can return to a point we touched on earlier, which is that um, some people are experiencing this isolation for the first time, but many people are living with isolation on an ongoing basis, facing loneliness. How do they experience this situation? Is it a different case for them? I think it's probably slightly worse, to be honest with you. Um, I think if you're experiencing extreme loneliness, part of that is likely to be around kind of what you have access to and your access is going to be even further reduced. So if you're part of a pub quiz team that meets every Monday, then probably you're finding a way to speak to those people regularly. If you're, um, if you're part of any kind of social structure, you've got that as a safety net and people are finding ways to recreate that virtually. Um, the really difficult thing, particularly with older people, as you mentioned, um, is that um, I know from our services that we have older people who uh, we stopped closing over Christmas because we knew that there'd be people who wouldn't see a single other soul for five days. And we thought that was too long. Um, and I think those people are also people who are unlikely to be getting phone calls unless there is a structure there to put that in place and they're also the people who maybe won't know how to get onto that neighborhood whatsapp group or know how to find their local mutual aid group on facebook um so what we're starting to see um which i think uh local groups are trying really hard to tackle is some people getting a rolls Royce service while other people are getting nothing at all so the people that know how to ask for help um, and know how to say hi i'm lonely could somebody kind of connect with me are getting quite a lot um, and i think that um, that um, really speaks to the point that um, that Demetrios, sorry, my <laughs> thing's terrible. Uh, the gentleman to my right, I uh, was saying, which is you just need to really think about who is it that needs you to call them. I thought that was such an important point. Um, that it's really easy to call that person that's the most popular person on your Instagram and all of that sort of stuff, but actually, probably, you know what, that slightly cranky old uncle who you know doesn't see very many people and who's maybe alienated their neighbours, probably give them a call. It'd be really, that's going to be the meaningful thing you can do. I wonder if I can just finish by asking you all uh, whether you think this will become the new normal. Will social distance remain even after restrictions are removed? Uh, well, um, things won't go back to uh, how they were uh, in any respect, not in terms of our economic and social system, uh, not, not, not only because uh, you know we have seen you know the, the sort of damage that this sort of pandemic can do, but because we have to recognise that uh, 
this won't be the last one. It may not be the worst one. Uh, and, we, and we have to set up society in such a way that it's got the resilience that's needed to, uh, uh, to, to withstand that, that, this sort of shock. And, and uh, obviously, economic, in terms of our economic system, we have to do that, but in terms of our social system as well. So we've got to be prepared and we've got to use this as an opportunity to start to take the steps to put structures in place to make sure that the, I mean, really quite, let's put it bluntly, it's a scandal of loneliness in society, that that doesn't happen. It was there before this started. It's been exacerbated by it, and it mustn't happen. It shouldn't happen. We are we are a connected society, and we can help to make sure that it doesn't happen. So I think there's a real opportunity here to start to put in place structures, whether it's in local communities, whether it's through uh, you know face to face, or whether it's through um, uh, online networks or whatever. There's you know people are not short of ideas for doing this. So let's. Let's do it and, uh, and actually take this as an opportunity to, uh, to make things better when the thing's over. I would love to explore this more, but unfortunately we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us on Roundtable. Robert West, Elizabeth Archer and Dimitrios Chibrikos. Thanks again to our guests. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for TRT World Roundtable. But for now, from me and all the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.